Now I'm in a, a, an awkward position because I'm going to introduce the next speaker from here. Um, we have a, a panel, a really fantastic panel with Lucy Ives, uh, an established writer and poet uh, who is doing a book on Madeline's writing. Uh, and then she'll be joined by Leopold Lambert, uh, editor of The Funambulist, but also uh, was a close colleague of Madeline in her later years. So Lucy, why don't you come up to the podium? So let's, let's just see how this, how does this sound to everybody? Does it sound okay? Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, speaking of, of precedence, because precedence uh, came up just now, I, I wanted to start out today by um, going back a little bit to um, the late 1960s in New York City. Um, and uh, I don't mean for this to, um, let's see, ah, here we go. I don't mean for this to seem too narrowly historicist, um, but I think that this is an important point of departure because um, it helps us to see how Madeline Ginz's work is um, connected to conceptualism and conceptualist leanings uh, in contemporary poetry and experimental writing, um, as well as um, other strains of text-based art. Um, and I don't mean to imply that Ginz is um, merely conceptual in her orientation. That would, that would be way too limiting. Um, but I do want to provide a brief introduction to um, Ginz's early writing in the 1960s and 70s, um, which I hope will allow you to see her efforts in their uh, contemporary relevance and importance, um, and most importantly, in their intelligibility, um, because indeed her work is too often described um, when it is described in uh, broader uh, trajectories, uh, histories, as uh, being difficult or unintelligible. And um, not just that, but being a product um, merely of her own fancy rather than um, an engaged response to her times. So um, in this, this very short talk today, I'll say some things about Ginz's early prose and poetry, and I'll also present um, one of the unpublished poems that I've come across in my work in Ginz's archive. And I'm also going to outline, as I introduce you to this writing, the ways in which I think uh, Ginz's literary output should be understood um, in the years before she began her collaborative work on the Reversible Destiny Project. Um, so I'll discuss her poetry and prose in relation to this project, but um, also in their distinctness from it. And uh, these remarks are adapted from an essay that will appear in the May 2018 issue of Freeze Magazine and are also related to a longer, um, more involved academic article. Um, also briefly, just to say about the, the title of this visionary cybernetics, um, cybernetics, as we know, is a transdisciplinary approach to um, the study of or implementation of regulatory <coughs> systems. And I like to use this as kind of a a quick gloss for some of the ways that I'd like to speak about um, Ginz's ambitions as a poet and a philosopher. So um, in the spring of 1969, um, the poet, prose writer, and artist Madeline Ginz joined a collaborative effort to make artworks and writing on the streets of Manhattan. 
along with John Giorno, Lucy Lepard, Adrian Piper, and Hannah Wiener, among others. She contributed to the final issue of Vito Acconci and Bernadette Mayer's legendary magazine, Zero to Nine, which took the form of a special supplement titled Streetworks, and you see the title um, page here. Uh, Ginz's submission was a group novel uh, for which she asked the reader to quote, please finish these sentences and return this paper with the ultimate goal of creating a group novel, an historical novel, an exploration of the nature of consciousness. Also included in street works uh, were photographs by Ginz and Arakawa uh, of a stylized house floor plan laid out on a plastic sheet that could be unfolded on the sidewalk. This floor plan also appears in the end papers of Ginz's first book, 1969's Word Rain. So the end papers here. Um, and I will read the whole, t the whole title of the book is Word Rain, open parentheses, or a discursive introduction to the philosophical investigation of G-R-E-T-A-G-A-R-B-O, it says. Suggesting <laughs> the coincidence of the, 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 the floor plan and the end, this image in the end papers. Um, a connection between the exploration undertaken in street works, the group novel, and Word Rain's ecstatic experimental prose. Um, in the questionnaire included in street works, uh, Ginz announced her interest in the possibility of a novel collaboratively composed by individuals who might also be its readers. In Word Rain, she began to describe the complex relationships entailed by a textual situation in which the reader and the writer are not, strictly speaking, divergent or separate. A situation in which authorship is extended to the reader too, even as the writer looks on, observing and recording the results of this invitation, along with the meeting that ensues. Um, so before I turn to some readings from Word Rain, I want to say a little more about street works and why I think that this publication is so significant for our understanding of Madeline's work. Um, this might sound like a sort of minor mention in the, in the history of conceptualism in the US. Um, however, I think it's important to emphasize that many descriptions of um, poetry's interaction with this particular mode and, and moment of art making have tended to focus on the static materiality of language to the detriment of descriptions of interactivity. Uh, though there are many exceptions, conceptualism's role as a critical capstone to trajectories in American art, including modernism and minimalism, has entailed the reduction of language at times to a quote, kind of object, um, as the critic Liz, uh, Liz Kotz has written. Um, accounts of language-based conceptualism emphasizing what um, the artist Roy Ascott in his 1966 essay on behaviorist art and the cybernetic vision termed the quote, field of behavior, are more rare. Um, but we can see that with street works, um, which is a project that takes place on the streets of New York and requires the behavior and input and awareness of friends, colleagues, and strangers, um, language does not function simply as an, as an object. Um, it's a site, it's an enticement to act, and it is a form of action. Um, Ginz's group novel called for action. Uh, unlike the group novels created by the artist Douglas Hubler and um, Andy Warhol, for example, Ginz's project was um, not a locus for confession, um, nor was it really um, an anthology of, of, of gossip. Um, like Vito Acconci's poetry, which played with the instructive nature 
of writing and marks of punctuation, um, or, for example, um, Dan Graham's uh, poem. This is this is one half of the schema in the poem. This is the poem um, from 1966, um, a list of materials for the creation of a poem. Ginz's early writing in street works and in her first collection, Word Rain, um, are self-reflexive, but they also do something more. Uh, her early writing directly engaged the cybernetic qualities of the conceptualist impulse by deploying sentences and prose fragments as a means for holistic control of discourse, the human body, and social relations, confusing the agency of the writer with that of the reader. And this occurs in a manner that reflects Ginz's literary and transdisciplinary concerns. Um, and this is what I, what I mean by kind of visionary cybernetics. Um, Ginz's interest in systems and communication often went beyond description of what is merely possible into an intensely imaginative uh, and speculative realm. In other words, she treated the slow dawning of the computer age as an incitement to produce art. Um, so that's uh, an image of word rain, which is, has a sort of uh, truncated mise en abime effect uh, going on there. Uh, and this is quite fitting uh, because word rain is a book about reference to both the act of reading and the act of writing. Uh, but the speakers of the sentences of Word Rain is not quite the writer, nor is she quite the reader. She is someone who exists in relation to words and who is aware of the possibility of reading as well as the possibility of writing. She is aware of the possibility of sensing writing, whether looking at it, touching it, dwelling in it, even sometimes smelling or tasting it. She writes about these possibilities as well as their possible results. And this is a passage from Word Rain. Read this with me. Read that with me. Read with me. Read objects, tables, toes, toads, tails, tin, trains, type, tears, throat. Read, write, read, write. This is only life. Only I write and read. If you've misplaced me on your own, bring me up again from off the page. I give you this book for a present. It comes with a room, light, a country, sky, and weather. I will arrange for you to be made aware of these in detail. You may look at everything. You will see only what I see look at this sentence. <coughs> so Ginz's narration in Word Rain places unusual emphasis on the experience of being simultaneously a producer and receiver of writing. Experience, tactile, olfactory, temporal, visual, etc., is folded into Ginz's sentences. And the sentences in turn produce such experience, which must be re-described in a sort of feedback loop. Word Rain might thus be a memoir of the present, of the very instant of writing, a sort of homeostatic temporality, occasionally difficult to differentiate from the biochemical mix that includes the body of the writer slash reader, as well as the interface of the page. There is a thickening here, a layering of sensitivities and sensors of data and processes over physical and textual space. In a radical reimagining of the traditional hierarchy of figure and ground, Ginz makes the theme of her writing her writing, as well as your slash the reader's reading. She substitutes process itself for the literary text's traditional mimetic ends. And so Word Rain's writing sometimes schematically envisions its own sentences and paragraphs. I'm just going to jump forward to show you that. Um, sometimes it becomes quotations uh, derived from other books, other texts. 
um, it makes everything, even that which it records and repeats. Nothing can be taken for granted, not the presence of the reader, not the time of reading. Even the time of reading has to be made. And I want to read one other passage here. In this case, a good idea which I have given you is to do the opposite of what I say in spite of yourself. Please don't touch the book and no kissing. Think of others before you think of yourself. Don't think of your family and the danger they are in at every moment. This is not the place for that. Perhaps the best way you could help me now would be to disappear, vanish, don't read the next paragraph on this page. Forget that you have ever seen this book. Scream for every word you will not see. Perceive nothing. Lose track of me. Kill me. And I hope that I am assured that you will not read between the lines. Um, it's an extraordinary book. This is the last page of it. Um, I should also say that Word Rain has no direct American literary antecedents. Um, though it superficially recalls various stream of consciousness writings or uh, Gertrude Stein's bristling <coughs> syntax, its strategies are specific to its own obsession with the reception of writing that occurs even and especially in the very midst of writing. This interest in the flickering, oozing, Chaplin-esque persistence of consciousness as recorded in and affected by the work of art is not easily reconciled with modernism's obsession with literary form and the dramatic upending of academic categories. Uh, nor does Ginz's work dovetail neatly with late modernist and postmodern literary experimentation. Uh, you can't quite group her with John Cage or Jackson Macklow, uh, who were so deeply concerned with chance operations and collage, and Yoko Ono's fluxus tasks are meanwhile uh, more art meticulous in their articulation. Um, there are some resemblances between Word Rain's complex sentences and those of poets such as Lynn Higinian, Bernadette Mayer, whom I already mentioned, and Leslie Scalapino. Um, but Ginz's friend, the poet Hannah Wiener, um, a cybernetically inclined writer and performer, is probably the most convincing analog. In a piece titled Trans Space Communication, um, Wiener has an observation that I think is relevant. She says, the amount of information available has more than doubled since World War II. In the next 10 years, it will double again. How do we deal with it? Uh, she continues, at the moment I am interested in exploring methods of communication through space, considering space as space fields or space solids, through great distances of space, through small distance, such as the space between the nucleus and the electrons of an atom, through distances not ordinarily related to the form of communication used. And Wiener treats the poem as a tactical event, um, an act of communication that occurs through great distances uh, of space. In her 1982 collection, Code Poems, which some of you may be familiar with, um, there are lists of encoded flag hoists that promise to transmit information even if the exact semantic messages of these lists are not always clear. While Ginz's sentences in Word Rain are more concerned with the time of writing in a domestic setting, they make similar claims regarding the significance of spaces, techniques, media, and technologies of communication, and the ever-increasing amounts of information available. Word Rain sentences are complexes of signals that transmit and confuse sensation allowing the reader to become an energetic receiver, an accumulator, a transformer, even, and I think most visionary of all, the avatar of the writer. Um, so I think as it already been suggested, it's difficult to categorize Madeline Ginz in a professional sense, to call her just a poet or an artist or a philosopher. Um, 
And she, in her work, she moves in and out of prose and, and poetry all the time. And in her 1984 collection, What the President Will Say and Do, uh, she returns to more sort of traditional lineated um, poem form. Um, and although in 1994 when she publishes um, Helen Keller or Arakawa, uh, the, this is another sort of novel-like um, piece of writing like Word Rain, um, she's always stretching these categories in, in highly original um, directions, blending observations about the activity of consciousness, language, English syntax, as well as her own body and environment uh, with the wry humor regarding the oddness of the very existence of meaning. So although what the president will say and do does not appear in the exhibition, you can see both Word Rain and Helen Keller or Arakawa in the exhibition, I wanted to talk about this book a little bit as well. Um, does that mean that I'm, oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I did, I did not realize that. Um, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll go quickly here and just say that this, this is an interesting book about, it's a book about authority essentially, um, and it contains uh, various different forms. There, there, there are aphorisms like these, which I find to be very funny. These are sort of answers to the question of what the president will say and do. Uh, for example, always place infinite systems, um, hang six scarlet bands to come within inches of the floor, et cetera. Um, and you can see there are, just, there are these other strange elements that are included in the book. Um, these sort of like essay stories. And then finally, this is the end of the book and I just wanted to show this to you because I think it's, um, it's hysterical and, and relevant, as they say. Um, I, just, I, I thought I would just point out this one line in the list of ways in which the president reacts. Um, the president says, um, it made me very, very sad. I thought that was funny. And then the president also says later on, I don't mind anything except the fact that my penis was mentioned several times. 1984, folks. Um, really great. Um, OK, so I'm, I'm out of time, unfortunately. Um, but I just want to conclude with one of the poems from the archive, which is also included in the exhibition, which is this poem, um, which is a, a poem that is about love as a schema, but also about, um, you know, speaking of the cybernetic, the impossibility of reducing it to a gesture of control. And I'll just read this poem for you. Uh, how do I love thee? Let me graph the ways. I love you past the margin of error to where the seepage of the calculus knows how to reassemble, to where parody outstrips itself. I love you diagonally as mind holds body. I love you with the thonic union of the point. I love you with the wraith of asymptotic breath and with the parabola which phrases speech. I love you in any transformation, as in above. I love you as transformation, near and by. Any unit holds you. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Great, and now we'll hear from Leopold Lambert. Hi everyone, uh, big, big thank you to Irene and uh, Tiffany for having organized uh, both the exhibition and, uh, and this event. I think for many of us it's quite an emotional moment uh, for this to happen, M maybe much less for, much less because we might have needed uh, some sort of validations to, to recognize the work of uh, Arakawa and Madeleine Gins, but uh, maybe more so because it allows us to share, uh, to share this work with a uh, 
uh, an, a, bi a bigger amount of person, including um, people in architecture, which I am always, I'm always very thankful for this kind of conversation to happen. Um, so today I will speak about a political reading of their work, which I should say is a little bit difficult to do because uh, you know when you speak about your own work, you're only able to damage your own work, so that's kind of okay. But uh, when you speak about other people's work, then it becomes much more complicated. So I would say it's very much my own interpretation of their work. It is a very sort of uh, unsubtle reading of their work, so I would, I would maybe bring that to your attention. But uh, that being said, uh, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a very important uh, way also of reading their work in addition of all the other sort of propositions that have been made so far and that will continue to be made throughout the afternoon. Um, so one thing I want to do is to, before really talking about their architecture work, I want to talk about maybe what I consider to be maybe not as much their exact antithesis, but let's say some things that I would call uh, models of inclusion in versus uh, revolution, the revolutionary paradigms that they might, they might embody through their architecture. So for me, for me, this sort of paradigm of inclusion goes through uh, uh, the work of uh, American uh, designer Henry Dreyfus. Uh, and, uh, and I think it allows us to see how architecture is systematically uh, designed around, uh, around uh, a set of standards, a set of bodies, of normative set of bodies. Which, are, which, have much, sorry, which have much less to do with uh, a question of majority or a question of average, as we usually think of normality, but very much in a question of power. Uh, the, the, normal, the normalized body being the body um, that very much crystallizes the domination of uh, a certain set of dominations of power. And it is uh, very much a racialized body, it is a gendered body, and it is a body involved in uh, ableist. Uh, 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 logics, um, and so, and so you know, obviously, when it comes to that, and when it comes to work that has been trying to sort of uh, ex make explicit these normalized bodies uh, around which architecture and design are are, uh, are built around, uh, you know, we can think of obviously of uh, Neufert and uh, and Ar architects' data, and um, and maybe I don't know Le Corbusier's modular or this kind of paradigm, and then. What I like with Dreyfus is that he's, he, he sort of includes what we would, again, uh, call inclusivity in trying to, in trying to sort of um, really very much uh, includes differentiation in the, in, the, in the types of body around which architecture would be built or design in his case because he was an industrial designer. Uh, he would even include uh, a gendered, a gendered uh, uh, differentiation, but I think, uh, I think if you look at his work, you, you would realize very quickly, and, and you know, his work is just a symptom of something much bigger. It's not, it's not about his work per se, but uh, that it very much, this gender differentiation of body is very much a sort of calibration of uh, a gendered uh, uh, attribution of, uh, of labor and the division of labor in particular in the domestic spaces. Um, he would go as far as uh, designing for people, the, people with uh, disabilities, uh, being, in, uh, being in wheelchair, or uh, walking with crutches or canes, and I'll go back to the idea of the cane a little bit later. Um, and obviously around, around this normative body comes a normative space that keeps sort of, God, so aggressive. <laughs> uh, so that, that, keeps, that keeps being involved in this sort of loop between the norm informing designs that itself reinforce, reinforce the norm and so on and so on. So I think the, the, the various attempts uh, at, uh, at uh, sort of something we might call inclusion that Dreyfus may have been involved with is very much uh, reinforcing in a very strong, in a very strong manner uh, this this loop, this violent loop, uh, and we can see we can see as well how uh, there is a question of um, the proportionality, proportionality of violence is like the the further away you are from the dominant bodies, the, the more the violence of design will sort of be expressed uh, to your body, 
And, uh, and you know, uh, we, we've been talking a little bit about children earlier, and we've been, we've been showing also some, uh, some folks that were maybe a little bit more aged uh, in the Mitaka loft earlier. And I think that's also, uh, that's also something we can, uh, there's, a sort, there's a sort of universality of this violence as, uh, as children and, 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 uh, and elderly that we might experience uh, regarding normative design, but I think uh, at, a, at a more, in a more specificities, we can, we can also see how uh, um, it's, it's design is very much involved in the in logics of uh, various logics of, uh, of, uh, of structure, structural racism, structural misogyny, and ableism. Uh, so yeah, so we can see we can see how far uh, how far this uh, violence of the norm uh, inf informing the space and the space itself reinforming the the body is operating through uh, Dreyfus drawings. I mean, he himself talks literally about something co he calls human engineering, which I think also says a lot about how uh, how the loop is complete. Like it's not just about the norm informing design; the design itself is very much trying to re-influence the body and to somehow push it towards this norm. Um, and so I think what, what, what basically those examples, those examples are telling us uh, are first and foremost that they think what a body is because they very much show us what a body is. And the, the, various, attempts of, as, uh, the various attempts at inclusivity are perhaps suggesting that we might not know what a body is, but somehow there is still some sort of lying, uh, underlying truth that a body might be something that, that is uh, within the potential possibility of knowledge. So a text that uh, my good friend Minha Pham and myself have written in 2015 was very much trying to go against that with uh, maybe a, a funny big title for the new inquiry, Spinoza in a t-shirt, but the subtitles being a manifesto for designs that do not know what bodies ain't. So like it's double negation. It's not that we don't know what body is, are, sorry, it's what, that we don't know what body aren't. So we were interested in this double negation, in the, in the impossibility to, emer to sort of establish any definitive knowledge on, uh, on the question of bodies. We've been looking at various examples. Uh, maybe less so those ones, but uh, others. I mean, uh, we're going back to Comme des Garçons. That has been a very interesting uh, collaboration between Reka Wakubo and Madeleine Gintz at the, at, in the very last months of her life that I was uh, lucky enough to participate in, uh, as some, of, some, of, some other of us. Uh, and, um, and so that's something that we particularly see when it comes to clothing because of its more immediate relationship to, to the body. But I think I'm interested in looking at how architecture also has been informed in that. So uh, another sort of body of work that uh, I find particularly interesting in putting in dialogue with uh, the work of Arakawa and Madeleine Gintz are uh, the, the oblique functions that Claude Parent and Paul Virilio have been sort of thinking about in the, in the 60s all the way to the, to the 90s, uh, very much involving uh, you know, we were talking earlier about a non-flat architecture, and I think that's uh, I think that has a lot of resonance with uh, the architecture of um, of Arakawa and Madeleine Gintz. Uh, even though I would say I'm fairly fairly confident there is no box with like any architectural reference any whatsoever. I'm, I, I think I can say that with pretty high confidence. Uh, and so going going uh, to their work themselves and looking maybe at some drawings that sort of would have sort of would have something that uh, that could echo those very rigid and normative drawings that Dreyfus have been have been establishing I think we can we can look at that and uh, and in particular the way uh, they've been mapping what they what they call themselves landing landing sites uh, and uh, thinking of a very very thinking of bodies in a much less essentialist uh, manner. Um, um, I'm sorry, where am I? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we talked also about Helen Keller, which I think remains like a, a fundamental figure of, uh, of the work of Arakawa and Madeleine Gins when it comes to architecture. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I think, I think everything to, was, was said uh, by Momoyo-san earlier in, in, uh, in the idea that it's not so much, you know, we're not talking so much about a person that we sort of uh, we sort of um, 
assign the, the label of, of, of disability uh, and sort of see how they replace this disability with some other with some other skills, but much more how we are so uh, close-minded on the on the possibility of sensory system that the body might be might embody, uh, uh, and uh, and how um, how to use your words. Uh, 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 Ellen Keller was using senses that we don't really have names for. I thought that was extremely uh, helpful uh, to think that way. And so, and so looking, looking at the architecture itself of, uh, of Arakawa and Madeleine Gaines, I think we can very much see how uh, there, is no, uh, there is no attempt to inclusivity. There is no sort of essentialization of some bodies that would probably work better than others in, this, uh, in their environment, but very much an environment that challenges every body in two, in two words. Uh, and, um, and that does not necessarily, uh, and that, are, that is also not necessarily meant to be f f fully experienced. Uh, which is also a big difference with a sort of very optim optimalized uh, vision of architecture as a, as a fully uh, experienceable space. Uh, so um, looking, looking at different architecture, I think we can, we can very much find uh, the, a similar, uh, similar approach to that in various, in various ways. Um, uh, in the in the Bioscleve House in particular, um, and uh, and in relationship as well to the the, the way the body is is also uh, perceived in space uh, with this sort of this sort of play on the on the height of the building in relation to bodies as well, um, and so yeah, I like I very much like this photo because Madeleine is on it and it was a very fun lunch. Uh, and so going back to those very joyful and playful photos of the Mitaka loft, uh, I, think, uh, I think something that has struck me when we had talked uh, again with Momoyo san when I, I realized an interview of hers that you can listen online is uh, her talking about one of her close relatives that uh, usually walks with a cane, going back to the idea of the cane, uh, in the um, uh, uh, in um, on flat floor, would not actually need one uh, in in the loft, and I think there there is a sort of very a very uh, close-minded way of reading that as a sort of resurrection of the body by the by the loft. When actually we could we could think much more closely that the, the cane is not so much something a sort of prosthetic that that helps to uh, that that would help a body to sort of um, deal with its own degree of disability, but very much uh, a, a sort of a symptom of the, the, non, the, the highly normative uh, uh, nature of our common environment. I mean, the flat floor being one, I mean, someone mentioned, I think it was Julian earlier, who mentioned like, yeah, I mean, when, when you see, when you don't see a flat floor, it's a little bit baffling, but I think, uh, I think Madeleine would very much often say that flat floors are not made for human feet to start with. I mean, we don't have flat feet, do we? Uh, it's, very much, it's very much made for a sort of optimization of, of the use of the floor by uh, ma things maybe like the wheel, so like more vehicles. Or, um, and so all that being said, again, like I said, that maybe, uh, maybe that was, that's my own interpretation, that maybe the word even Political would not necessarily be a word that Madeleine and, and Arakawa would like to hear necessarily associated to their work in, in such an explicit way. But I think I cannot resist also, and also to very much echo with, uh, with Lucy's uh, presentation, uh, to finish with uh, my favorite poem by Madeleine uh, in this book of what the president will say and do. So you, you have to go a little bit fast, but uh, so I, I, can, I can also adapt a little bit to it. And I'll try to read it, it uh, even though I have there is absolutely no way that I will have the same eloquence that Lucy demonstrated. But okay, let's go. <laughs> All men are sisters. There simply could not have been a woman who would have said, left side, right side, then stuck to it. For a woman, it is a question of at least seven sides, at least one of every, of every you, hue. 
such subtlety, such subtlety contributes to the subtle difference. One thing men haven't realized is that, unlike them, all men are mortal. Women do not die. This makes all the difference. Although some women have been, have been brown bitten by sheer syllogistic brown, have at times pretended. Most women do not, like them, do not look like themselves. Although many women do assume the form of women, some are men, other gas and electricity, and still others are indistinguishable. Often, being constructed of living material, women are a volatile force in society and as such dangerous, and should not be left near adolescent, I think is the following. And this is from 1984 with yeah, very high echoes with our, with our current reality. I love that you said that. And, uh, and I will end up on that because I just so much love this poem. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. Those were wonderful presentations. And now we're going to put Lucy and Leopold in, in conversation. I know they've been emailing each other, but they actually just met today and have a, a really shared interest in Madeline's work, especially. Uh, and after their conversation, we'll take a short coffee break. <laughs> Hello, Leopold. Hi. Hi. Um, one thing that I didn't that I didn't get to say, and I feel I would be remiss if I if I did not do this, is is just to mention that the two books that I talked about by Madeline, um, Word, Word Rain and What the President Will Say and Do, both of these books are out of print. Um, Word Rain is very difficult to come by and somewhat pricey, although um, What the President will say and do is somewhat easier to find. However, I want to emphasize that both of these books can be obtained by you from the internet and various booksellers. And they are so wonderful and you can just, you can, you can do that and you can have them. Um, and I, so I'm hoping that we will be able to produce a collection of Madeline's writing um, so that all of these books can be collected together along with her um, unpublished works, but I, I just want to emphasize that these books are out there and that they like they need they need love and they, Thank you. so you know please please look for them and also for Helen Keller or or Arakawa which is also out of print so just to, I want to say that and now what done. the what the president will say and do is also available in open access on the Yubu oh, web yeah. so there is a PDF of yeah. it somewhat less beautiful than the book um, but nevertheless legible. Um, so to go to the, the point of this sort of like um, the normative body, um, I think there's a resonance with, with that notion and a kind of like normative reader or things around literary genre that I see Madeline as uh, fundamentally resisting, but not even responding to. Like she just does something else. It's not about a, like a response to that. It's it's just like she's al she's already doing something else. Mm -hmm. Like sort of like right out of the the box. And I'm just curious about your experiences with Madeline as a writer and as a poet, if you could talk to us a little bit about, you know, how you experienced her in that way. Hmm. Um, that's funny. I'm more used to actually interview people than to be interviewed. <laughs> but, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, well, I think I think maybe I can I can answer about that maybe going back to also something I wanted to talk with you about because mm -hmm. I was very glad you say that sort of addressed the fact that um, we tend to perhaps a little bit too quickly uh, associate her writing and their work in general as being uh, as being deliberately uh, unintelligible which I also think is. Uh, is, uh, is, is a, not a very fair assessment. And, and I think similarly, in the various conversations that we could have, uh, there would be, they would need a little bit of a work to sort of, uh, to sort of take the time to interpret what had just, just been said. Like Madeline was not someone who was 
sometimes a public figure and you know at the office or somewhere else being like you know someone else or something she was very much a, a holistic person for that matter so so when you would speak with her she would tell you things that you would think are very complicated to understand also because even though they might not be a big reference towards uh, architecture, I think they are, as you, as you showed a little bit, there's a lot of reference in their work to, uh, to, to philosophers and uh, to literature work and to poetry work and understanding very much how a word could have possibly been corrupted by decades, if not centuries, of sort of additional meaning to it uh, would probably leave, let them to create their own words uh, anew uh, to express exactly what it what it was that they wanted to say. So when you work with her on a daily basis, sometimes it it has its challenges because you <laughs> you you just ask, okay, should we do it two feet or should we do it one foot? It's like, well. <laughs> That could that could lead to a very a very uh, interesting uh, conversation uh, based on a very simple question, but I think I think that's that's the sort of the magical part of it uh, in in how much it allows to also uh, participate to this project with with your own sort of understanding of what it is that was being said, and I, I really don't think there was any sort of I mean, I, I think I think the 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 sort of the the anecdote about talking for ten hours the first time the first time you meet, even though you probably would guess that it was going to be five minutes, in the is very much showing that there was no will of obscu of obscurity uh, for the sake of obscurity, and very there was very much a very very big generosity in talking as long with anyone really. I mean, at, at the end of her life, uh, uh, Madeline had. Uh, uh, had someone coming at home, uh, a, a nurse, a nurse coming at home, and the, the conversations they would having, they would have would be very much uh, to the same, uh, to the same of the same nature than they would have that she would have with anyone else, uh, and um, and so so I think that's that's really uh, that was really uh, great to be able to to also build your own meaning based on what you would hear, but. I don't know, I would like to ask you actually about this relationship to intelligibility or non-intelligibility since you started with it. Okay, yeah. Well, um, you know, one way that you can think about, and, and really the, because I did not, I did not know Madeline, um, and so I, I'm a person who relates to her through her writing and through her, her books, and I just want to point that out that may already be obvious to you, but um, there's a great deal of, of of ignorance of the person that that is a part of how I how I act as a as a reader of her work. Um, but to say that there's something about you know when you when you go um, and look at listings and different descriptions of of word rain online in library catalogs or um, on the part of booksellers, often it's referred to as an artist's book. So what is an artist's book? An artist's book is a book by an artist. Um, that's not, it's a, it's a sort of vague description, but it's a kind of book um, in which certain kinds of conventions uh, not only are mutable, but we expect them to be um, altered or touched or affected in some way. And this book, uh, does that very much. In one of the slides that I showed, um, you could see a photograph of a hand um, reaching up to touch the page. And this is also visible in the copy of Word Rain um, that Irene has placed in the exhibition. So this has nothing to do with what we consider literature, right? This is a sort of like visual intervention. Uh, do I need to interpret this, engage in an act of interpretation in order to understand what this is? Yes and no. And it's that yes and no that I use also as a reader of Madeline's work. So in other words, when I read her work, I also look 
at it, as she continually in her writing instructs me to do as well. So I'm just doing what she says, honestly. And when I engage in that kind of uh, reading act, instead of relentlessly attempting to find the meaning of what she says, quote unquote, then I'm fine. I don't have any problems because I can just look. Um, so that's my recommendation around these issues um, in relation to intelligibility. And the same could be said, although what the president will say and do doesn't have the same kind of artist books uh, interventions in it. And um, Helen Keller or Arakawa sort of doesn't either, although there's some sort of typographic interventions there, you can still engage in that, that looking. And so that, that is how I, I, I do not f find that there's an issue with intelligibility, mm -hmm. but that also makes the works maybe impractical as literature. Uh, so that's another, but that's another question. Mm -hmm. So different one. And, and so since you're writing specifically about Madeline's writing, do you, do you actually stop somewhere in the bibliography or do you actually go all the way to the, to the very last manuscript that she was writing? Uh, well, okay, so about what I, am, what I am writing right now, I mean, I'm, I'm writing some articles about her work and um, my, my primary work in relation to her writing is as an editor, so I'm not, writing a book about her. I would like to do that at some point, sure, but I'm editing a collection of her writings. And so far, I'm still, I still find myself in the beginnings mm. of this. And I'm at this point, as you're seeing from my talk, of fascination with her work in the late 60s and 70s. Um, there's a great deal of poetry in her archive that is, is that poem that I read is, is one of them from the, the 60s and 70s. It's just extraordinarily beautiful and it's unpublished and I really hope that it can be published. But so the, the goal is really to go through everything and yes, to the, the final work and, and everything like that. But there's just an, there's an enormous amount of material mm -hmm. and she changes over time too. Her interests change and so it's also a challenge to sort of figure out how does it all like how does it all connect? And maybe it's not necessary to come up with some theory or like perfect through line. I mean, honestly, usually that's not that helpful around someone's work to sort of like be able to see it as a whole. Like it, it can contradict itself. It can do things that is, are not anticipated, are forgotten and, and so on and so forth. Mm. So yeah, um, I think that's, that's my, my answer to your, to your question, but I, I want to ask you um, more about uh, if and, and how, um, you know, did you, did you ever like write with Madeline or hmm. was that part of a uh, practice that you guys shared? No. <laughs> no, no writing. I, I would have been, I would have been very embarrassed, I suppose, but. Uh, well, but, but you are but a some, writer. Some too. Yeah, but more of an essayist than okay. a, an actual writer. So, okay. I, I, uh, but um, no, I can I can actually share something funny about what we worked on. I mean, yeah. we we mostly work uh, as well with uh, St. Luck was right there. We worked on the on the and uh, and of course uh, Yoga Post was over there. Uh, we worked on this uh, bio, uh, this incredible biotopological uh, uh, scale juggling escalator that you've seen uh, in Momoyo's presentation, uh, but also on something extremely funny, which was uh, a sort of, uh, I was doing the illustrations of a poem she composed about the Krebs cycle, so the, the, yes. the biological cycle uh, involved in the di digestion. <laughs> so with like molecules, uh, molecules uh, uh, transforming it, I mean, you were talking about, you involved transformation earlier. Uh, so a very, uh, again, like a, a, a perfect example of how, um, how philosophy was able to meet poetry, was able to meet science, uh, was able to meet architecture uh, uh, and art uh, in, this, uh, in this practice, which was really wonderful. 
Okay. Well, maybe we should, should we stop there? Um, or open it up, I don't know. Yeah, if Do anyone we, has it any. It depends if we have time or not, I don't know. I think there's, there's time for a few questions, yeah. but maybe a couple minutes if anyone has any. <laughs> so you no, not, not. So did not expect well, it. Well, you, you, <laughs> if you're too intimidated, you can you can ask any of the speakers during our short coffee break, um, and I'll I'll round you up in about 15 minutes or so. So. Oh Thank wait, you. there is one oh. kind person. Oh, yeah. okay. this is a very uh, simple question. But what happened with these drawings? And it goes uh, beyond only these drawings. But uh, I was trying when, when I saw the exhibition yesterday with Tiffany that many of the drawings that are uh, included in the exhibition have never been sold. And actually, there was, as far as I understood, there was even the question of how to, to, to exhibit them, uh, because there's no record of any hanging before. So, so probably you can, you can give a very direct, oh, sorry. Uh, you can give us a testimony of what was the way of the drawings and the production uh, of uh, Madeleine and before Arakawa and, and Gins uh, travel to other spaces uh, in your case, in your experience. Are you, you're, you're referring to the drawings I was just talking about in terms yeah, of yeah, the yeah, illustration? Yeah, exactly. Those ones in particular, and if you, uh, if you have a knowledge of what happened to other drawings, for instance, the, in the exhibition, there's drawings that uh, were never exhibited before. So yeah. I'm very and intrigued. It, what, was the, what was the way that their future was in, and their trajectory was envisioned within the space where they were produced? Yeah, I mean, that, I think that's also why, uh, as Irene and Tiffany pointed out, is like there's uh, this current exhibition is very much oriented on the production of the 1980s and very beginning of the 90s, and I think there there can be there can be uh, uh, three more following that uh, uh, based on different eras. Even though it's probably interesting as well to break from the strict chronological rule as well at some point, uh, but. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, the office was, uh, so I, I left the office before, when the office was still the office, so to speak, as this, this one, one to four uh, Houston Street uh, incredible building, like magical building. Uh, and, uh, and it was still full of, still full of drawings everywhere. I don't, I don't know what happened to them. <laughs> it's, it's, it's probably very well archived somewhere. But, uh, uh, yeah, they might, they might, you know, they might surge again somewhere sometimes. Uh, uh, but I think it's it's kind of interesting to to also sometimes have them sleep a bit and then sort of exhume exhume them again. I think it's quite interesting, and uh, and that's been also my privilege, uh, uh, despite our sorrow to have lost Madeleine uh, in January 2014, to, to continue working at the foundation to to go through the archives because it was pretty much every day discovery of new documents and and even you know the most uh, the most moving moments are also the photos obviously of uh, that sort of documented uh, and I'm very I'm very happy that uh, some were included in this exhibition as well. Thank you. <laughs> Well, this is hard. This is a difficult question for me to answer. Um, and again, what I have access to are these material things that exist and accounts of other people who knew Madeline. But I, because I am so interested in this early work, I want to say something about the publication of Word Rain. Um, so Word Rain was published um, by an individual named Richard Grossman, who had his own um, publishing concern, Gross Grossman Publishers. And it 
even though it is an artist book, it was not published in the way in which artist books aren't, I guess, normally. I'm not sure there's if there is a norm published. I mean, it was it was published as it was it was reviewed somewhat widely. Um, people were kind of confused about it. There was a review of it in Publishers Weekly. Um, really, you can go look at it on the internet. It's quite interesting. Um, so I don't know if. Um, Madeline thought, you know, I'm going to be a novelist with a capital N. Maybe she did. I would kind of like for her to have thought that. And there's a way in which also um, in, you know, you have these traditional kinds of materials here, like here's your author photo, and then there's a little description of the author, and it talks about other books that she's working on, um, so that you can get ready to like go out and buy them, you know, it's like be waiting for them to come out, and I, I love like like why isn't why isn't why aren't there like a million books like this? I just want it to be that way. Um, it's so this book is so extraordinary and so beautiful, also because of the way that it it ignores kinds of limitations that we would just take for granted now, divisions between the worlds of art and poetry and so on and so forth. So I think that's my answer to that, but I don't know, you know, it seems like things change as time goes on and her practice and her relationship with Arakawa change and so on and so forth, but um, she does appear as an, as an author, you know, in the, in the way one does as an, as an author, even though her practices as a writer are not those that we would normally associate with authors. And that's, a, that's quite interesting. <laughs>